Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll just wait a couple of minutes for everyone to log on and we'll get started. All right. In the con in the interest of time, we're going to get started. I'm really excited for you all to join us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, really excited to have three amazing panelists with us today. And I will begin introducing them um, to get just to get us started. So uh, up first, we have Katya Grukovsky. Katya Grukovsky is a Ukrainian born and raised New York City based artist, educator, curator and founding director of the Immigrant Artist Biennial. Grukovsky's works has been awarded the California Studio Minetti Shrimp Artist Residency at UC Davis, the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts Studio Program, Sculpture Space, Museum of Art and Design Residency, Brooklyn Arts Council Grants, and many more. Welcome, Katya. Your experience curating and founding the Immigrant Artist Biennial has inspired us, and it has also helped countless artists to put their work out there. Thank you for being here. Up next, we have Tristan Scott Behrens. Tristan is a New York-based director, writer, and producer. Tristan began his career as an actor and worked for many years as a wardrobe stylist while building the career he has now. His personal works as a writer and director include Only Trumpets, Lilac Lips, Duchess County, and The Man of My Dreams, which have been featured at top film festivals. His films and music video work have also been featured on Paper Magazine, Days, Interview, and Sean. His day jobs have him going between directing segments for CBS's nationally syndicated By Design and serving alongside Neon Heart Productions founder Rhiannon Jones as the executive producer. Upcoming films include the Rhiannon Jones penned and Hannah Pearl Ut directed Cora Bora, Kids Ahar's This Closeness, Alexandria Bombuck's It's Only Life After All, Chestnut, and Monica Sorrell's Mountains. Tristan's support of immigrant filmmakers in the film Mountains has inspired us, and we wanted to have him to be part of this panel today. So welcome, Tristan. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have Jasmine Valencia. Jasmine Valencia is the founder of JB Agency, with an artist-focused marketing and a culture-building approach, Valencia has helped advance the careers of top-selling artists that include The Killers, Fallout Boy, Avicii, American Authors, Max Frost, and Shawn Mendes, just to name a few. Ms. Valencia is widely recognized not only for her, for her business and creative acumen, but also for her down-to-earth attitude and motivational approach with her team and artists alike. Welcome, Jasmine. I've known Jasmine for many years. I met her when I was an intern and I was trying to challenge myself to write about music. And I can attest that Jasmine is one of the most grounded, smart and inspiring friends I know. We're really excited to have you all today. And for uh, those in attendance, I just wanna let you guys know that there will be time for any questions you guys have. So as the panel goes on, if you have a question, you can drop it in the Q&A box for our panelists to answer later on. So today we will be focusing on the topic of representation, its, impa its impact, its importance, and what it means for artists. Specifically in the context of who stands up for artists, who advocates for artists, and how can artists navigate being represented within their fields. 
So we have some questions that our panel will be answering today. And the first question that I have is, when thinking about representation, how can we foster a more inclusive environment for immigrant artists within the art community? And what specific steps can organizations and institutions take to achieve this? And Katya, as someone who works within the arts and with artists of various mediums, would you kick us off? What is your take on this question? Um, sure, thank you so much for having me, for inviting me today. Really happy to be here. Um, okay, so uh, to start us off, I would say, so I think many organizations and institutions really disregard and unfortunately misunderstand um, the challenges that immigrant artists face. And actually many are not willing to listen and to accept. Um, and I think the right way, I believe the right way forward, moving forward to create a much more um, inclusive environment for immigrant artists is to really broaden the scope of who gets selected and who get who does the selecting. Um, and I think that's basically the problem in the art world specifically um, is who's in power and who is curating whom, um, who's in the room really. Um, you know, I think institutions don't really often look out of status quo, of what they know of programs, of presidencies, of, of you know, recommendations. They look to what's already out there. It's kind of perpetuating the same idea constantly. And I think to really also listen to other artists that need to really broaden their reach where they look for artists, um, to really listen to other immigrant artists, recommending other immigrant artists, to go to places where they might not be comfortable with their other languages are spoken, other cultures are in, in the US, so you don't have to go internationally, it's all right here. Um, and I think I've experienced a lot of that kind of door slammed in your face simply because of bureaucracy. So I think institutions especially need to really think, read through their guidelines and understand that certain you know application rules and um exclude a lot of people immediately just by virtue of you're not a citizen you can't apply you don't have a green card you can't apply why not um why can't we open doors and you know really open up the gates <laughs> um because there's a lot of gatekeeping and on all levels in the art world in in the variety of situations in the variety of you know um I don't know, it's it's kind of a culture of the art world is to be really exclusive. So how do we make it much more open? It's a constant conversation. It's constantly a lot of work. Um, I think that's why I wanted to create a platform of my own, something like a biennial, other immigrant artist programs um, around the country, we can look to them for recommendations. And I think institutions really should collaborate so much more and also really, reach wider audiences that's another big question that happens with immigrant artists because they bring their own audiences as well their own communities um and that's often really lacking in what's on view so um that's kind of my take on on this question thank you any of our other panelists have anything to add The, the, the space of film is, is quite similar. There's so much gatekeeping at play. Um, and yet the US is one of the only countries that that doesn't have a film council or a film fund or a way of supporting filmmakers who are artists. It's really a commercially driven industry here, which um, can really complicate the entry for immigrant artists, but also people who are approaching filmmaking as an art form and not as a commercially viable venture. Um, so there are there are a lot of resources available to young filmmakers or new filmmakers who are starting out in the field or people who have projects that are much more artistically minded. Um, something for immigrant artists to connect to, especially those that are living in the United States specifically, are to connect back to where they've they've come from to see what kind of financing is available based on their countries of origin. A lot of them will have Film, film funds or film financing available that may be able to be accessed depending on the language that the film is going to be made in or the location that the film is going to be shot in. So that's always a really a really first step in having the conversation with, with filmmakers who are 
not U.S. born. Um, and then, other, and then from there, there's a great benefit to having to having a film that that doesn't necessarily take place in just you know the Hollywood field, and especially if there are other languages involved. There is so much more um, access to audience, so it's really about figuring out who the audience is and how to get that film to them once the product is is made. So it definitely there are definitely a lot of barriers there. They look a little bit different, I think, than the art world barriers look, but um, yeah. Thank you. Our next question is, navigating the art industry can be daunting, especially for immigrant artists. What steps can artists take to find trustworthy artistic agent, manager, or other representations who understand their unique needs and background? Jasmine, would you open us up for this question? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think the main thing, especially in the music world, similar to film and art, there's all these barriers to entry. Um, and so it's a lot about who you know or what connections you have. So if you're coming here as a new artist, um, the first thing I would advise is to look at similar artists that kind of um, have the same vision as you, have the same, you know, maybe even sound, you know, similar sound and see who's representing them. Who are the people that are helping that artist, you know, be, be popular in their field and, and do what they do best? Um, you know, if you notice um, anytime any artist gets an award, they always thank a team, right? Because it takes a whole team of people to get somebody, you know, to get all these, you know, accolades. So always looking at similar artists and, you know, thankfully with the internet, it's so easy to reach out to people on Instagram, LinkedIn. And even if it's just for an informational interview, they might not they might not end up representing you, but they might know somebody that they can refer to you um, that might be doing something similar. So I always say start there. Look at other artists that are doing something similar that you are doing and see if you can reach out to those people. Um, all the information is readily available online. You can most artists list their team on their Facebook pages or on their website so you can you know easily reach out to them. Um, and most people, you would be surprised, most people are willing to have that, you know, that one on one with you, even if it's like a quick 10 minute phone call of like, this is what you should do, or this is maybe try this, if they're not the right person for you. Um, so I think that's a good way to start for any artist in general, see what other similar artists are doing in your field and who's representing them. And that way you already know that person, because uh, you can see what their team is doing for them, right? So you can see, oh, I want to be featured and I want to be in that festival or I want to be in, you know, that that um award show whatever it is because then they're already doing what you would want what you're aspiring to do thank you any of our other panelists have anything to add i think i think that that's such a good point and i think that so many artists or filmmakers whatever, whatever the medium is expect that those people are going to seek you out and i think it's really important to, to realize that most people who have representation didn't necessarily get it because they were just making the work. You actually have to go that extra step and go out of your way to reach out to those people and make make them aware of what you're doing. Thank you. And Tristan, I'm curious uh, to know as a filmmaker and executive, what challenges have you faced in finding representation for yourself and filmmakers you work with? And maybe what strategies have you employed to navigate these obstacles? Yeah, well, as a queer filmmaker myself, it became it was really a um, learning lesson and figuring out how to get my work to the people who would connect to it the most. I think so often when we're early in our careers, the things that are the most appealing are the, fl the flashiest, fanciest things that we've heard of our whole lives. But those are not necessarily always going to be the places to connect the most to your audience initially as you're as you're starting out. So I I would say to what you know whether it's a, a, specifically in film whether you're making queer film or you're an underrepresented voice in some way find the spaces that are supporting whatever wherever it is that your voice is underrepresented and go out in, in as many ways as you can like I think right now we're really seeing a push against narratives that are specifically about the thing that makes you different, you know, queer stories are no, no no longer necessarily just about coming out, right? Like film festivals will support a story about a queer person going through a wide variety of things. I think that uh, Define American is really um, supporting stories that are, that are redefining what an immigrant story looks like. So I think creators can 
understand, need to understand that their story doesn't have to be about the thing that makes them different. There's still organizations and ways of supporting you because of who you are. And uh, I think to just find that place to connect, to, to connect as an artist with people who are like you is, a, is you know, or has a similar story or similar experience to you is a really, um, and for me, that was the most beneficial way to get my work into the audiences that I was making it for. Anybody else have anything to add? My next question has to do with uh, conversations, financial conversations, which can be challenging for anyone, but I think particularly for artists and immigrant artists, there can be additional complexities, additional layers. Uh, Jasmine, as someone who works representing other artists, uh, maybe creating contracts, agreements, what are some things that you recommend artists should look for when reading these contracts? Yeah, I think number one is never sign anything that you don't fully understand 100%. Um, that's the biggest thing that people think because it's maybe, um, you know, a label they've always wanted to work with or an agent they've always wanted to be signed with. They're like, sure, I'll sign it, give it to me right now. And they don't fully understand what they're signing. So I think that's number one, uh, making sure you're 100% understanding anything that's on that piece of paper. If you're not sure, there's a lot of resources of, you know, online of like, you can hire somebody for an economical fee um, to look over a contract for you, or just to answer a few questions, if you can't afford, you know, a, 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 an attorney and retainer. So there's a lot of resources like that that can help you if you just like, you know, I understand everything else, but this paragraph is really throwing me off. You know, they can look at just a section of the of the contract for you. So I would say start with that. And then also, if you have a mentor or somebody that you can trust that you go over these things, you know, talk it out with them because they might see it from a different perspective that you're not seeing it. Um, sometimes we get too close to something that we miss the big picture. Um, so if you have a mentor or somebody that you're close with that can look at these things for you, if you don't have an attorney or somebody that can help you in that, in that regard. Um, but the most important thing is also always trust your gut because if you're looking at something, you're like, wow, that's that's my dream label, but something your gut just doesn't feel right, that there's a reason for that. So at the end of the day, like, let's say, for example, if you can't afford an attorney to help you, if you don't have anybody else to talk to, but all you have is your gut, go with your gut and always like trust your gut feeling and like make sure you're 100% comfortable with everything that's on that piece of paper. Um, you'd be surprised the amount of times where, you know, an artist signs something and then down the line, they're trying to get out of it and they owe money or they don't own the masters. And it becomes a whole bigger mess than had they taken the time to really focus and understand everything they were signing, you know, they wouldn't have been. And, and obviously you can get out of these contracts and figure out a way out and, and make it work for you, but it's a lot of work that can be avoided um, if you do your homework at the beginning. Thank you. Katya, I'm curious as an artist, uh, what are some things that you would recommend visual artists should look for when signing contracts or agreements? Um, really good question because I, I do this a lot all the time and I really advocate for myself. And so I always say uh, you must advocate for yourself. Uh, read the contract thoroughly, really, really read between the lines. And if you don't understand, ask a lot of questions. Um, any new program you're starting, is this, is what is this? What is this? Is this, you know, is there a fee for my labor? Our visual artists get take advantage of constantly. We don't get paid for much actually. So if you're signing a contract, if it's commercial gallery, make sure you know what your percentage is. Uh, make sure there's no hidden agenda, hidden costs. If you're signing a contract with a residency program, um, this happens all the time. Make sure you know what's what's included in the residency, so there is no surprises, which happen often. Um, you know, oh, oh, there's a deposit. Do I get back the deposit? What, what, what are the really nitty gritty issues that come up constantly? If you're signing a big fellowship, make sure you know when you get paid in that fellowship. Make sure you know all the deadlines. Um, this happens all the time. Artists are kind of often excluded from these conversations, these kind of financial, extremely important sustainability conversations. I wish there was more of this in schools, in grad schools, professors never bring this up, um, how to sustain, maintain, that's a whole other panel. But I would say with going back to contracts, um, uh, that was mentioned before, always, always read it. Again, if, if your English is not that great and you really, sometimes I misunderstand the bureaucratic language or legal language, just 
you know, ask an American friend <laughs> to look over it who really understands this country, because this is a whole other ball game for a lot of us. And we need to really dig deep into there's so much nitty gritty that you must you might have signed something and then you get an invoice for something you're thinking what what is that or or your percentage is wrong your percentage is not 50 50 with the gallery but actually 60 to the gallery and which is happening more and more and then you get the, such a small cut or for example someone wants to ship your work um, across the country and they don't say anything about the shipping costs or framing or I always bring this up immediately if someone's wanting to ship a work of mine, will this be framed by you? Or you do expect me to frame this if it's unframed? Or who's covering the costs? How, how does this work before we get to the show? Before I sign anything, let's talk um, and ask questions. A lot of, and I know a lot of immigrant artists are sometimes afraid if you, they get this amazing opportunity and it sounds unbelievable. And you're finally making it to the top tier of something. And then you get a contract and it's mind-blowingly wrong. It just feels wrong. Like you've got to say something, really look it over, ask them questions and, and get into it. Don't be afraid to be annoying. I get annoying. <laughs> I get, I asked so many questions because I'm afraid to get into something and then just not be you know, valued. Um, our artist labor, we would do so much for free. So what does that mean then to get this amazing opportunity and your labor is still devalued, uh, even though you need this opportunity sometimes for your visa, you can't say no. Your time, your clock is ticking if you're applying for things here, if you have status issues. There's a lot to, to being an artist plus an immigrant artist. So I always say, you know, get someone else's eyes on this who might be here longer, who understands the art world much better than you, who's more established than you. So having a mentor, as mentioned before, is really important in this and having, and not being afraid to ask. I think that's an advocate for yourself. I think that's really important. Thank you. And Tristan, I'm curious, what would you say a film, filmmaker slash actor should look for in contracts, agreements, things like that? Yeah, I mean, so much of, of it is true to what has already been said. Um, I would say beyond a mentor, it's really important as an emerging artist to cultivate a group of peers that you can rely on as support as well. And I think always talk to those people about what their experiences have been when you're signing a contract. Look to see who they have, who you know who has worked with, whoever it is that you're getting into a contract with and call that, call your friends and ask what their experience was like with working with those people. I have I have made the mis mistake early in my career of not um, getting the right contract for myself, being so excited for the opportunity and not wanting to mess it up. And um, you know that you you make that mistake once and you learn from it. I think any contract is always up to, up for negotiation. That's really important to keep in mind. Um, and film little little details that that would maybe not seem important for someone who's starting out, like your credit, what your credit is. Where is it placed in the order of the film? All of these things actually really make a big difference because they, they start a precedent. So if you're if you're only working for a certain amount of money and your credit is low, it's going to take you longer to build to a higher credit and a higher wage, you know, in your career. So those those things do matter. Your credit placement can affect how much money you're valued for as either an actor or a producer or a production assistant like it all it all matters i also think in the the world of freelance um having a contract is important so oftentimes people want to hire you without a contract i encourage people to always ask for one and you want to stipulate what happens if you've blocked up blocked me out for this week and the job goes away that which happens often right especially in the times of covid where you know all it takes is the director to get sick or the the main actor to get sick and the whole production is shut down meanwhile the other people on the team have been declining work so really you want to make sure that that is always stated like what is the kill clause what at what point can the, the production be canceled and do i get half of my rate do i get my full rate like all of those things are very important to negotiate so so that when you are turning down other work the work that you're holding it up for is protected um yeah that's that's my two cents thank you I think all of these are amazing um, points and uh, it made me think a lot about um, oftentimes we think of like our agreements or we're working on a project with someone or an organization and uh, I think too it's important to also be mindful of our time and like those 
meetings that oftentimes turn into several meetings before we even get to a project and all of that is time. So it's something that I've had to learn the hard way is um, to put a boundary on like how many meetings I'm open to having before I'm, you know, going to be part of a project. Is it only one or am I open to several? So I think that's another part too that I've had to learn the hard way. And then in addition to that, something that Katya mentioned especially when it comes to residencies that might be out of town or a project out of town, uh, making sure that we're seeing this more and more, but making sure that if there is a budget for travel, what happens if there is inclement weather or uh, some kind of natural disaster and you have to be stranded or your flight you know, is delayed? Like, Is there flexibility? Is there a contingency plan for that in case that happens? And that's another thing I've had to learn the hard way. And, and I think it's important to just keep in mind as, as we're seeing more and more of these things happening. And so wanted to add that as well as part of uh, the conversation. But let's think back a little bit to the topic of money and, and financial conversations. Uh, how can artists approach discussions about compensation and contracts with their representation to ensure fair treatment? Tristan, would you open us up for this question? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think there there's a few different things at, at play for artists, right? Like we all have to find a way to make a living, but we all want to make work that is important to us and finding that balance can be really tricky. It's it's a very lucky position to be in as a filmmaker or, or any kind of film worker where the things that you're making are both creatively fulfilling and financially sustainable and rewarding. Oftentimes we're having to to do one thing that we're not as crazy about in order to support the other. Um, I think that it's really important for creative people as they're making those choices to realize what they where, where they are in between the two. I will often work for free for, on something or for very, very little on something that is creatively really important to me. Um, therefore, it's very important to realize when the thing is not creatively important that you're getting paid what you are worth because if you're taking away the time from the things that are creatively fulfilling then it needs to be giving you enough financial support so that you that when you're not getting paid it's making up for it if that makes sense and i think that pe people need to also realize that the things that you're doing creatively make you more financially valuable on the things that are less creatively rewarding so if you're going out to direct a, a commercial and it might be very straightforward and boring and it's not taking your creative energy in the same way they want they want you to work on that because of the things that you've done creatively and those are the things that are making you hireable um so, so yeah i think it's important to really hold that duality and know why it is that you're doing the, the job and like i said before talking to talking to your peers i think it's really important that, that people know what other people are getting paid for the same work and it's you know it's not something that is comfortable it's not something that is um, culturally acceptable, but I think we really need to start normalizing in conversations. Like, how much are you making? How much are you? How much are you getting paid? How much is this client paying you to do this job? Like, it's it's un uncomfortable, but it's something that we just have to kind of move past and start really talking to our friends about. But also talking, you know, in, in a film, there's so many different things at play, and a lot of people will negotiate their different rates and their different positions separately talk to your other friends on set and you know find out how much is the hair person making how much is the wardrobe person making um just so you know where you kind of fit into the the bigger picture of how the money is being distributed any other thoughts or ideas um i can add to that in terms of i really agree in terms of your peers and community um kind of discussion that needs to happen much more in the art world specifically because we <laughs> there's so much free labor involved in in establishing yourself as an artist that it's it's just that's how it is and it shouldn't be so i think i i wish there was more advocating happening by artists and but there's just a lot of fear of then being excluded from opportunities and not 
and being being also labeled difficult, which I'm totally fine with, by the way, um, and saying no to things, absolutely fine, because I've done a lot to establish myself here, a lot of free work, just hours and hours, and I'm not willing to do that anymore. And and now uh, it's it's sort of, oh, people keep coming to me because they used to do it for free. So there is always a precedent. So now when I say, no, I have a fee for that, there's, you know, oh my God, now you're difficult. Oh my God, what a diva or this and that. And I think that shouldn't be this kind of uh, mountain of free labor to get to a certain point, but it is still that way. There is still a lot of fear with emerging artists of saying no to things because there's no artist fee, there's no shipping, there's no hand art handling. You do everything yourself. And there is a beauty to DIY, which I started, doing that too but I think we need to really get together and often advocate especially when institutions don't pay especially when it's other other strong communities you can collaborate you can exchange but when it's institutions and and they just want you to do something for lunch for example an artist talk or you know it's just shouldn't happen but it keeps happening um or, or when work gets lost which I've had I've had that a lot with galleries. Oh, we we can't, we we lost it. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, and you don't have any money or any any legal help to to get that back. And you know, there's a lot of black holes in the art world, and it's very unregulated industry. So I think we do have power as artists, and and we should have more power as artists. So getting together, getting your peers into this conversation, um, often asking each other, how did you do this? How are you sustaining yourself? What is happening? Um, what are the artist fees? What are the what is going on? Is is something that I wish would happen more and more, and I hope it 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 will in the future. I just want to add on the music side. Um, similarly, you know, there's that. How do you measure what you're you know what you're bringing to the table, right? Because it's the music is so subjective. Um, but what I always tell artists is don't do something that is gonna put you like off if like just even just on the cost right if you have to show up to a gig but you have to hire a band to help you you have to hire you know people to sell your merch you have to hire all these other people to help you actually make that performance um if they're not even covering your cost then maybe it's not worth it for the exposure that you're getting um i think similar to what you just said if it's a an organization a company there's got to be some sort of budget to cover some of the expenses, if not all of them. It's different when it's like a friend or it's a bunch of artists doing something, you know, just for the culture and for the community. Um, but it's definitely different when it's an organization. Um, similarly, like artists have come together to go against like Spotify, for example, to raise the money that um, songwriters get, that artists get, you know, on streaming. So it's we all kind of have to come together in order to make these changes actually happen. Um, you know, like I think Taylor Swift is one of the only few artists that can do it all by herself, you know, which she did in the case when Apple Music launched. She was like, no, 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 you're not paying us. You're not doing this for free. Like what's going on here? And she obviously changed this for the entire industry, which was great. So we need more people like Taylor Swift to speak up. But also in the meantime, we together have to do it together um, to actually make a change. You know, if everybody start, stop using Spotify they would start paying the artists more if all of us stopped using it all of a sudden, right? Um, so doing things like that, you know, and obviously it's hard to get everybody to do something, but it, you got to start somewhere. So you got to, even if you have to start small within your community, those are the ways that we're going to kind of change the, the way things are run. Um, but always advocating for yourself to at least get your expenses covered. You don't want to be out of pocket for something. Well, it might be great exposure and it might be a cool thing to have on your, you know, something that you've done. Um, you know, you can only do so many of those before you're like, hey, I got to pay my bills and eat my food, you know. So so having that line drawn, um, you know, like you were saying, knowing your boundaries of like, what's the exposure versus the benefit and is this going to help me long term? Um, so just having that in your mind whenever you come into any conversation about finances being like, if you really want me to do this. This is like the minimum I can take for it because this is just my flat rate expenses. Um, and just having that in mind whenever you're going to, some, to talk to somebody about it. Thank you so much. Uh, gonna pivot a little bit, um, also just keeping an eye on time, but I wanna ask um, language barriers and cultural differences may present challenges in the representation process. I'm curious to know how can immigrant artists effectively communicate their artistic vision and goals to potentially to potential representatives or agents. Katya, I'm curious to know if you can open up, uh, open us up for this question. Sure. Um, 
I would say, well, in the visual arts, learning <laughs> learning how to speak and write about your work is absolutely crucial. So even though we are visual people and we speak with images, but we also have to speak for it. Um, and I would say if you didn't go to school in the US or in an English speaking country, sometimes it's very tough to translate your already developed artistic language into another art speak in English language. So my advice is always to do a lot of workshops, to attend a lot of artist talks, just even online, to const to really get to know your field, to um, line up your favorite artists um, and listen to them. How do they talk? How do they develop their persona? What? How do they represent themselves in the world? That's part of the parcel today. You cannot get a lot of things without writing about your work. Um, so showing to a native English speakers, getting other people to look. Sometimes you just don't have resources to hire anyone at all. So, you know, talk to friends, but also talk to your peers who have already done things and who, have, who are more established here. That's been really crucial for me, having the right network and, and people to look up to um, and really learn the ropes of the industry. I had to learn from scratch here um, and kind of, but I went to grad school here, which really set me up to understand what it's like in terms of presenting yourself, in terms of crafting a persona. It is a persona. Um, so how do we do that when there's a lot of cultural barriers and a lot of language barriers? It is practice. It doesn't come naturally to most visual artists. A lot of us are dyslexic by nature. <laughs> so we, we're very visual and we need those visuals. So make your work so strong, but then make your also your, um, you know, written and oral skills really strong as well. Even if you speak not quite right, it doesn't matter. It's part of your persona is your English, your, your accent, whatever it is that sometimes makes us really insecure. Um, it's just, it just becomes part of it. And that's what's unique about you. So I think then presenting that in a way package, it's also packaged like in any other industry, presenting it to institutions, to galleries, to um, on social media, online. It's all kind of crafting your website the right way, checking your artist statement 100 million times with someone else's eyes. It's all part of, part of kind of, and it's constant learning, so it never ends. I don't think there's a stop to it. You're always evolving. And of course your work is evolving. So for me, language barriers early on did really make me insecure but i think i i often listen back to i do a lot of lectures i teach a lot of talks a lot of travels um i listen back and i'm always surprised I'm like oh i think i have an accent oops um does it matter no at all so <laughs> it's it's sort of but it's been brought up to me by students often or people who don't know me and it's it used to make me insecure and i think people with much stronger accents um also struggle with that so I always think, well, that's, we'll think of Marina Abramovich, whose accent has not changed, whose English has not changed in years and years of living in the US. It doesn't matter. It's part of you. It's actually becomes, that's what people want to, want to know about you and want to represent is that whole cultural uniqueness of you. So instead of making it a very fear, fear based kind of, I don't fit in, I should speak American. Um, it's more about, you know, who are you and how do you represent yourself in the world as an artistic personality? That's kind of been my kind of route and my advice. I would say too, like working as an executive producer, we're, we're getting, we get sent so many different projects and so many different voices that for us, like it's really actually quite appealing when a voice comes along that is fresh, you know, it's, some, it's from someone that we haven't heard from before in the film space. Like that is very exciting. So I would say for people who are, feeling that insecurity just know that the people that like us who are looking at the things that are being sent our way like we are excited by that so if there is something that what, whatever it is that is special to your story like embrace it include it as part of your package that you're bringing to the table even if it's not what your story is about even if it's not what your art is about it's we're looking we're looking for for new things new voices that aren't heard from so um I definitely am excited excited by that. And I would also just say to other people who are in my position, it's it's not always on the artist to have to tell us everything either. Like we have to do work 
to figure out what the cultural differences are. We should be researching before we're getting into a project about what the cultural differences are. It's okay to ask questions of the people that you're working with if there are blind spots for you, but it is not on them. It's not their job to have to explain everything to you all the time. So go out of your way. And if you are working with like an immigrant artist or, or someone who has a story that is very different from your own world experience, just do a little bit of, a little work, do a little research to understand where they're coming from culturally and it will, really enrich your, your working experience, I think. I just want to add about the the accent. Um, I know a lot of people get conscious about that. What I always say is like, hey, you should be proud that you speak more than one language. I mean, that's really, that's a great accomplishment. So you should look at that as an accomplishment. You speak more than one. Um, so that's just my two cents on that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I, I can, I really appreciate that also as a non-native English speaker. Uh, I think for me, one of the things that helped me to just be more comfortable with public speaking and just speaking in general and a language that I still trip up sometimes. And I uh, actually like just talking about art and writing about music is very different uh, when you write about art versus when you write about music. So just like exploring different artistic mediums and having something to focus on, like an album and why did this artist choose this color palette or the way they interact with their fans or with an artist, like the way they selected a certain uh color scheme so uh but yeah it's it's very interesting to hear all this amazing insight thank you all all right so one thing that i wanted to bring up too is that earlier this year define american launched a resource called creativity is boundless which is an advocacy guide for artist support organizations and grant making programs to make fellowships, grants, and residency programs more accessible to all, regardless of citizenship or immigration status. In addition to that, we also launched uh, Storytime, which is my pride and joy. Uh, it's a newsletter that includes stories, shout outs, and a curated list of opportunities that are open for immigrant artists, as well as different resources. Uh, if you want to put, uh, if you want to subscribe to uh, Storytime, we we're going to put the link in the chat box. But a question I have for the panelists is, um, for all all the panelists, anyone who wants to jump in, are there specific networking events or platforms that cater to uh, immigrant artists seeking representation, and how can artists make the most of these opportunities to connect with potential agents, managers, or galleries? Um, on the music side, I think it all starts with your community. That's like the state or city that you live in. That's where it starts because there's always going to be, you know, a Korea town or, you know, any part of where you're from that people in, in that, you know, community like really help each other. So that's kind of where you want to start. Um, that's a good place to know who the right person to go to is, where the right resources. Um, so I, I would say that every probably major city has its own community for whichever country or region you're from, um, or you can find somebody aligned. And of course, you know, Facebook has a group for everything. Uh, so that's also another way, way to look for people that um, can help you succeed in your field, especially for music. There are a ton of groups, you know, people from, you know, that like focus on Afrobeats, Latin music, you know, all the different genres. There's definitely that community within, within that. Um, so for music, that's the best place you're going to um, find things. Um, and there's other organizations like South by Southwest that like brings artists overseas here for, you know, their yearly uh, festival um, that you can apply. Um, yeah, so there, there are many like that that you can find information. But I would say if you're if you're brand new and you're looking where to start, start within your local community, you'll find amazing resources. Yeah, I would say that that's so similar with with the series of film with our film mountains. It was a, a, a story in little Hades, uh, Miami's little Haiti, I should say, um, and they made the film by bringing the community together. Of you know, both on screen and off, it was a community effort using community resources to get access to locations, hiring friends to be production designers and um, cinematographers, and really bringing a community together to like get the thing made. I think for filmmakers, once your work is created, just connecting to film festivals is such a such a beneficial way to extend that community beyond who it is that you're working with directly and to get access to journalists or other, you know, other ways of getting your work out there. But 
but definitely starting within your own community first is a, is a great place to begin. Um, so I can mention two platforms that I know personally and have been um, especially like instrumental um, in my development that also highly recommend um, New York Foundation for the Arts Immigrant, Immigrant Artist Mentoring Program, um, which is um, based in New York, but I believe there are other chapters around the country now. And all, all, also just a great resource. They have a lot of things online. Um, it's where immigrant artist community and where my biennial sort of stem from. Um, so I was a mentee and a mentor for many years and that community every year um, was really, really crucial for me to understand how to enter the art world. So I think that was that's a great platform. And another one, which I believe also stemmed from that program, but is now a separate and it's a website and it's, I think, based in Bay Area, it's called Immigrant Artist Network. Um, these are visual artists based, but they're also multidisciplinary um, sort of. And so they have salon, virtual, mostly virtual salons and connections where you can connect to other artists and it's a network. So those two, um, and and also there's many, many others, but I think um, I also, oh, and of course, immigrant as biennial, um, but also always encourage people to start their own thing as well, because I believe there's not enough of these platforms. There's not enough of, um, of these kind of opportunities to get together with other immigrant creatives. And I, because of uh, my project, Immigrant as Biennial, had to do a lot of research. That's how I know Define American, immigration, concept. you know, there's a lot of uh, other <laughs> programs that I know, but not a lot of them are arts related. So there's a lot of um, social justice, et cetera, which has to has to be that way. But I believe um, I, I would love to see more. So I always say, you know, let's let's start things up. Let's let's get immigrant artist galleries um, going, you know, which is not easy. It's a lot of money. <laughs> but uh, what else can we do? So a lot of these initiatives are mostly online, but um, that's kind of where um, I often also look for artists. So there's a, a feedback loop of also representation because I curate and my curators in the biennial curate. And we often look to programs like this for, um, for artists. So it's always good to be involved in those programs. So to put your name up or, you know, yeah, to be, to be in that community. Thank you all so much. And thank you for your insight. So uh, we have a few minutes left. I would love to take this time and hear from anyone in, in the audience. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box. Um, I do see one question here, so let me see if I can read it. Um, Ming Lo, uh, thank you for being here. I am ideating a benefit concert for public kinship and civility next spring. I would like to feature performing artists who are members of the global majority. Are there specific organizations or other resources you recommend? I'm starting with no experience in putting on an event for more than 100 attendees would like to answer? I think for our performances, um, you definitely want to start, um, like I was mentioning before, with your community, like depending on, you say 100 attendees, like where are you hosting the event? Um, because that'll determine what type of artist you want to have, um, you know, what the setup is going to be. So definitely once you have your venue, talk to the people at the venue because they're also going to have resources because they do events all the time. Um, so they're going to be able to help you out. Um, and as far as like who you pick as a performer, I think it'll de depend on, um, you know, what type of music you're going for, what type of vibe you're going for. But, you know, of course, like on Spotify, you can find art, you know, you can search the type of uh, music you're looking for. And there's playlists for all types of things. So, and you can just, they most likely they'll have their contact information on their socials. So that's a good way to start. Um, and of course, of course, depend on, you know, your budget, your timeline and all these other factors. Uh, but I think if you're, this is your first thing, start with the venue and the venue is going to be able to help you with some resources because they do events there all the time so they can guide you. Thank you. Uh, one question that I have for you all is uh, something that came to mind as, as you guys were talking about uh, putting yourself out there and kind of going the extra mile. I was thinking about how now with social media being so popular and so widely used between artists, brands, organizations, and that's how they put themselves out there. That's often the first place where I go to see, you know, and just learn about, you know, what what this brand is all about or what this artist is all about what what are they working on 
uh, what kind of content they're sharing. So I'm curious to know if you guys uh, have any effective strategies that artists can use to maybe attract attention from galleries or agents or maybe music representatives or film um, for their for their work. Um, what has worked for you all using social media and putting yourself out there? Um, for us, well, we represent our artists and we handle their social media. So uh, for us, kind of, you know, each artist is completely different. Um, so we always tailor something to each specific artist. But if you're an artist watching this and you're like, I don't know where to start with my social media is think about how you want the world to see you. What do you want the world to know about your art, whatever it is, whether it's music, film, art, um, what do you want them to take away from it? And that's what you should focus your content on. Um, and, you know, remember, social media is a tool that is at your disposal to get the word out about your work at the very, you know, so like, I know a lot of people overthink it and stress over it. And I know like it's caused a lot of anxiety. Um, I tell our artists, look at it as a tool that's free to use for, you know, for the most part, unless you're, you know, you're spending ad money, uh, but it's free to use and it's just get, helping to get the word out there about your work. Um, so that's kind of how we look at it and that's how people should start looking at it. I, I definitely use it to track filmmakers that we're interested in working with. Like, you know, so, someone may submit us a project that's not quite right, but there's something about their work that I like. I will often follow their social media or I'll have seen their film at a film festival and I'll follow their social media and I'll I'll use that as a way to keep track of how their career is progressing and if they're working on something coming up that maybe we actually could work together on. So I think it's, you know, it, we all have our issues with social media that it definitely has its downsides, but I think for artists, it's, it's the modern business card, you know, it's such a great way to like make that connection. It's, it's a great way for me to remember someone's face of like, Oh yeah, I know this name. I know this face. I can see all their work right here. So I think that people should be very intentional about how they're using it um, for filmmakers as well. You have such an access to it. If you do you show your work on your social media, where if you're reaching out to an actor, you can send, send a DM to that you want to cast or to a musician who you might want to say, Hey, can I use your song for free in my short film? It's such a great way to lead with a visual representation of, of what your work is. So I think it's really important to maintain it and to embrace the benefits that can come come from social media. I agree. I think it's, for me, it's crucial even, and I enjoy it. I know people, some people really don't enjoy using it, but as a visual artist, it's essential in, in our world. Um, I do find out a lot about artists online on social media specifically. Then I go to the website from their social media, usually Instagram because it's so visual. Um, and I think announcements of what you're doing is very important. People find out about what I'm doing now mostly. I mean, I, I do newsletters and MailChimp and all of the private, but I think more of a public persona profile is definitely, oh, she's there now. She, I, I, have, I do a lot of travel now, finally getting back to travel to a lot of it since pandemic um and that's how people find out i'm in town and and i'm doing something and <clears throat> i invite them to it i have collaborations spring up constantly that way i think it is a free marketing tool it is a business card it is really important um it's um essential really to to how i operate i always post something um what's coming up what i'm doing and i craft it very carefully i am very careful about what i share i don't actually share that much personal but my whole life is my art art life it, it there's no separation for me so whatever I'm doing it's going to be art and it's going to be my life so if I, and it's travel and it's all of this um so I find it very actually enriching then to exchange to follow other artists and I find curators that way and uh, some of my works have been curated directly from me posting about it on Instagram then a message, a follow up, and then a show happens. And that happened to me recently from posting daily from a residency program, a curator is curating then in a big show in New York and saying, I want that specific work that you did at the residency program. Um, so I think sometimes showing artists are fearful of showing too much in progress. So you have to be careful of what you want to show. Maybe something's not finished. You really 
you know, it's not cooked yet. So show a detail, you know, tease it out. It's, it's all kind of marketing. It's just another marketing tool, but I think because it's so available to us, it's in our pockets every day. It's, it, it is really handy. I do check up on galleries. What are they doing? Mostly Instagram now. So I, do, I, I, to me, artists shouldn't underestimate social media. It's just still the way it is. It might change in the future. We might have something completely different. We're not there yet. So um, definitely use it to your advantage to, to gain kind of a following and to have, you know, to have fans and collectors and galleries sort of checking up on you um, and, and surprise them with things. That's, it's always what people want to see is, you know, and, and also boast about it. I'm always like, just, you know, boast about your achievements. Why not? You worked hard. <laughs> so that's what it's for. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we have one last question here. Um, we have, uh, what is something you know now that you wish you had known when you first started working in your respective industries? Uh, for me, it's that there's not one way to do it. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to go to school to become a filmmaker or an, an artist. There are there are so many ways to to approach the career path. For, mine was so so off. I started as an actor. I then worked in, as a wardrobe stylist for ten years. Not because it was the thing that I was the most passionate about. That was never where I was trying to go with my career. But it was a way for me to get on set and to learn while I was being paid. And I think that. I, I did it wasn't intentional to take that path to get to where that I where I am today but by doing so it did get me to my my final goal um so I would I would say to people to seize whatever opportunities present themselves in the industry that you're interested in even if it's not always feeling like it's the first choice it's a way to get your foot in the door and to to learn and to build and to to begin the the path process and it can look it can look so different than than how you may expect it to I think for me um you know I I kind of fell into marketing and music so I didn't have a, a plan of it um and also like to start my own company so it's like you can plan all you want, but doesn't mean it's going to happen because life might have another plan for you. Um, so I definitely didn't know that, you know, like when I was in school, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, so I do something completely different now. So I think that's something I definitely didn't, you know, before I thought it was like, this is my plan. This is what's going to happen. And obviously life, you know, has a different path for you. Um, so always being open to what whatever that, that is for you, uh, because you will find yourself in extraordinary places. Um, so always being open to whatever the world brings your way. I think that's something that I did know before I started working in the music industry. And now here I am. So that's worked out well for me. <laughs> um, I think for me on reflection, I wish I just from the get go understood that, that rejection is going to be my middle name. It's just part of life, an artist's life. In the beginning, I took it hard and really struggled and suffered and still struggle, suffer, but it's it's nothing like it used to be. I think I just, just put it aside and moving on. Um, but rejection is such a huge part of um, an artist's life that it can really affect you. I know, I know people who have stopped working for years because of it. It can really crush crush you um when especially when it happens a year that's a lot of it like something you're doing is just not not being shown no one wants to see it but you keep working you're you're, you're an artist you're creative so that's what has to keep you going rather than validation really from the outside so that's something that comes with experience and practice but um and i i never stop working but sometimes it's it's it was too, really really hard to understand where the rejection was coming from i also expected so much to get everything in the beginning within the five years of graduating from grad school that's what you hope that's what's being sold to you but that's not how it is it's a life marathon it's not a sprint and so now all I think about is sustainability and sustaining the great projects I do run and have started and 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 really sometimes but there's no validation from outside understanding I have a community I have my own 
practice and I, I don't always I'm not gonna get everything that I apply to. That's just the way it is. So that's that's kind of yeah. <laughs> thank you all so much. I hope this has been helpful and I just want to say thank you to our amazing panelists and uh, for those of uh, of you all watching, uh, feel free to follow us. Uh, we're gonna have more events and different panels in the future and just stay stay tuned for more. Um, and I just wanna say thank you all. Thank you everyone for coming and have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Everybody. Thank you.